Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul and in this Red Game Digital video we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news which as usual has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with the Intel i9 for the mainstream. As you might be aware, the i9 has typically found itself relegated to HEDT products. So for example Haswell E or Skylake X, but recently Intel have slightly been a little more open to putting i9 to other platforms. For example, we saw the 8950HK, which of course was for mobile use. But now Intel are reported to be bringing i9 for desktops. So we're going to have the i5, the i7 and the i9. Now the i9 will be the i9 9900K or the i9-9900K if you prefer and from the reports we're going to be seeing this launch with the Z390 platform. So here's the thing, it's going to have 8 cores, 16 threads as you might expect with the i7-9700K having 6 cores, 12 threads and finally the 9600K having just 6 cores, in other words no hyper threading. So we don't have specifications yet on the clock speed, but we can almost certainly assume that the Coffee Lake samples we've seen, which are eight cores, which of course the engineering samples were 2.6 gigahertz, they went up to three gigahertz, are almost certainly going to be the same silicon, obviously improved, that we find uh, in these i9 processors. So there are a couple of questions that we're left with. The first is, Will these processors be backward decompatible? So, for the sake of argument, if you buy the i9-9900K, would you be able to put that into the Z370 motherboard, which you currently own? Well, possibly yes and possibly no. There have been a couple of examples of positive news which tell us that this might be the case. For example, we have seen the fact that um, the 200 series of boards have in fact run the Coffee Lake S um, 8 cores, but that's very unlikely that Intel will uh, maintain that level of backwards compatibility, so I would probably rule that out. The one piece of positive news, however, the Z370 and H110 motherboards from ASRock did have entries in the ASRock um, BIOS overclocking utility, which you can get, and you can actually see the entries there for 8 cores, so that does paint a rather good picture for the prospect of having that backwards compatibility. And the last one is that the PCH between the Z370 and the Z390 looks very similar. Of course, those additional cores could consume additional power. So it is possible that Intel might decide to not make this backwards compatible or just because they plumb don't want to, but it's too early to tell yet. From what the rumours are, the Z390 is essentially a rebrand and additional functionality would need to fall on third party uh, chips, which motherboard vendors would have to include on the board itself at most likely additional cost. So therefore, we will likely see a plethora of different price points for Z390 motherboards. So there are, of course, a couple of questions with that. What's going to happen with the Z370? Are we simply going to see it discontinued? And the last point, once again, is just, are we going to have that level of backwards compatibility? It's going to be very curious, I know I keep saying this, but I'm going to be very curious how AMD are going to respond to this. It's almost like a kind of semi-refresh, I suppose, of the Coffee Lake lineup. And most certainly we're going to be seeing it on the 14NM++ architecture, rather than 10NM, because obviously Intel have had so many issues uh, producing that. And I don't think they're going to be ditching four cores anytime soon. After all, simply because of yield reasons, they can sell those cores and make more monies, which is a good thing for us as well as customers, because not only do we get to purchase cheaper parts, but it also brings down the costs for the i9s as well, because it means that Intel don't get lots of silicon, they just simply have to dash in the bin. So moving over to Sony and Crossplay. This has been one of the most controversial things that Sony have done in a good while. Like, honestly, the amount of negative publicity they've had for this has just been absolutely monumental. And I have to confess, I think one of the smartest things that Nintendo has done is actually capitalise on this and actually put out an advert which was um, demonstrating Minecraft running on the Switch and cross-play functionality with not only PC players, of course, but also the Xbox One. Now, originally, there was numerous reasons cited by Sony for why they were not allowing this, everything from 
well, we don't believe that it's uh, good for our ecosystem, we're concerned about trolling and all of this other stuff. However, since then, of course, former president of Sony Online Entertainment, John Smedley, took to Twitter and he basically ratted out Sony and said, well, actually the real reason is just because, well, the money's. I find it rather amusing because these sentiments seem to be actually echoed by Sony themselves. They seem to have admitted this because as grabbed by Eurogamer during a Game Lab conference today, the CEO of Sony Interactive Entertainment, uh, Sean Lydon, said the following. We're hearing it. We're looking at a lot of possibilities. You can imagine the circumstances that affect a lot more than just one game. I'm confident that we'll get to a solution where it can be understood and accepted by our gaming community, while at the same time supporting our business, end quote. So they do appear to be looking at crossplay, but if you hear the last couple of words, once again, supporting our business, it does appear to be that Sony just want to somehow monetize the situation, which I think is kind of ludicrous in my personal opinion, uh, because it's like one of the reasons people would stick with your platform is the ability to play with other people because otherwise if there are lots of games which are cross-platform then perhaps others would just decide to buy it on the xbox one or buy the title on the nintendo switch or buy it on the pc so it's easier for them to play with a wider gamut of their friends then again i suppose some of this does also depend on the group of players you're playing with for example if most of your friends are playstation owners then it might not be that big of a deal but for myself, for example, even though I don't really play that much online, quite a few people I know are PC gamers and quite a few people I know are Xbox gamers. And yes, there are, of course, a lot of Nintendo Switch gamers and also a lot of Sony gamers. So it makes things a lot trickier if you're just locked to that one platform. But that's just my opinion. I'm curious to hear what you think on the situation. Perhaps one of the most talked about pieces of technology when it was first coming to the market was high bandwidth memory. And it does still hold a lot of promise, despite the fact that GDDR6 is very exciting in and of itself. The fact of the matter is HPM2 does require a lot less power and a lot less of a footprint on the PCB to achieve an awful lot of memory bandwidth. For example, with Aquabolt, you can have about 1200 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, just to put it another way, 1.2 terabyte per second of memory bandwidth, and still managed to pack 32 gigabytes of RAM onto the GPU. There's a problem though. Well, a couple of problems. One is it's quite expensive to actually design it. And the second one is that the actual chips themselves are very difficult to procure in large quantities because the demand is quite simply outstripping supply. And this has only been reinforced by a recent conference that Samsung themselves attended. With our production of the first 2.4 GBPS 8GB HBM2, we are further strengthening our technology, leadership and market competitiveness. This is according to Jesu Han, uh, who is the Executive Vice President of Memory Sales and Marketing at, of course, Samsung. And we will continue to reinforce our command of the DRAM market by assuring a stable supply of HPM2 in accordance with the timing of anticipated next generation system launched by our customers. The problem is, according to Samsung themselves, they can double the capacity of production and they still would be unable to reach demand for customers when it comes to HPM2. And it's no wonder that Samsung are so confident about this because not only is it being used in high-end graphics cards for HPC, for example we're seeing it in Radeon cards, we're seeing it in Volta and so on, and we can almost assuredly see it in the next generation of GPUs, even if only for the data center, but it's also being used of course for APUs. For example, we have the KB Lake G series where of course the eighth generation of Intel processors feature it along of course with AMD's own Vega GPU so it's being used in that and it's being used in other situations as well in other words HPM2's demand is going to continue to increase now that's not to say that I'm against HPM2 I love the technology it's just right now rather expensive and that's why I'm almost confident that we're not going to see any HPM2 GPUs for the mainstream for some time I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Navi for consumer level cards does go back to GDDR6 memory as well and these comments are actually somewhat echoed by AMD themselves. So I don't really need to introduce the Threadripper 2990X. It is a monstrous processor. It's running 
32 cores, 64 threads, is going to be backwards compatible, of course, with the X399 motherboards, which is very important. Runs at around 4 gigahertz when it's boosting on all cores, or turboing, or should I say, to all cores. And overall, it is going to kick butt. Of course, there's the inevitable question, other than, well, show me the real benchmarks, and that is, uh, well, how much is it going to cost? Do I need to become an, or an organ harvester? Do I need to start selling people's body parts on the black market? Well, you may need to do that, but the good news is not many individuals will need to be operated on by your hands because the processor is only going to cost around 1,500 euros, at least according to an online retailer. Now, that's still expensive. That's 500 euros more expensive than what the 1950X did launch at. And by the way, you can still get that processor at quite the steep discount if you do do a little bit of shopping online. But consider this. Consider the number of cores you're getting is double that of the previous generation. And then consider just how cheap it is compared to, let's say, the 17 the 7980XE, which I believe was like 2000-ish when it was launched. So you're getting a considerable amount of performance, a considerable amount of power compared to Skylake X and compared to the previous generation. Of course, how Intel responds to this with Cascade Lake and Cascade Lake X, should I say, is going to be curious. And I want to know what price point uh, Intel are going to be able to uh, hit into uh, AMD ads. And of course, what specifications we're going to see for those final processes. But either way, for the HEDT market, I think AMD might be onto a winner here. I mean, I with uh, with Intel previously versus AMD, I said, well, yeah, there are some definitely disadvantages that Intel have, uh, including the price, but there are some definite advantages Intel do have, including the fact that they had a higher core count skew, and of course, the clock speed advantage as well. The problem is, though, Intel are so far behind in the core count now that that clock speed advantage may not be a big deal. But, of course, we will have to wait and see what the final benchmarks are for the next generation of HEDTs for us to make an absolute uh, solid answer on that. I'm curious, though, if you are interested in buying a HEDT product, which one would you purchase right now? Um, would you prefer to wait to see what Intel are cooking up or would you prefer to just jump on the current generation or are you just thinking, screw it, I'm going to buy the 2990X processor? With the launch of Ryzen back in early 2017, there was an obvious issue with the processor. Well, actually, that's not true. It was more an issue of optimization of software running on the processor. And we saw subsequent patch up, uh, patches and updates for software, including Rise of the Tomb Raider, which drastically increased performance on Ryzen. We actually released a video and a series on that. You can check it out on the channel if you so desire. I'll try to remember to link it in the video description if you want more information on that. Of course, this made sense, right? It was a new architecture from AMD. Developers were like, well, we've basically coded for the older generation of AMD processors. And of course, we've coded for Intel. You can't expect us to just have things running immediately, absolutely fine and hunky-dory. And of course, subsequent patches, including for Windows operating system, did drastically improve things. But AMD have also had problems on the driver side of GPUs as well. But to be fair to the company, they're being a lot more aggressive with this. However, what we are certain of is that the next generation of consoles almost certainly will use, uh, especially the PlayStation 5, will almost certainly use AMD for both, for both the CPU and the GPU. Uh, Zen is almost a shoo-in for the CPU for the PlayStation 5, and most likely we're going to see the same thing for Microsoft on the next generation Xbox, probably Scarlet, it looks like. So Techland, Crow Team, and Flying Hog Games have just received Ryzen and uh, Radeon care packages. So what is the actual purpose of this? Is it to bribe developers to you know, use AMD products? No, 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 of course not. The purpose of this is to better interact with developers. The purpose of this is to enable developers to get a better understanding of, oh, okay, so this is the issue running on a Radeon GPU. This is the issue running on Threadripper. This is the issue running on a Ryzen 7. In other words, they can better figure out how to use that architecture. They can better use their engine to make full advantage of your hardware. And this is one of the problems I feel that Vega is definitely run into as well. I don't think it's been optimized. And 
This could really benefit something like Rapid Pack Math, which allows two 16-bit floating point operations to run concurrently as opposed to just one 32-bit floating point operation. And that might not sound like a big deal, but it can drastically increase the throughput of what the GPU is capable of. Obviously, it's not applicable for all the fix, but when you don't need that high level of precision, and not all tasks do by any stretch of the imagination, well, that could be a real winner for AMD. So it's going to be curious to see how developers actually embrace this and obviously amd is still kind of early on the reach out which is definitely something i will say that nvidia really have on the lockdown whether you like it or dislike it the way that nvidia courts developers is pretty darn smart and uh i think it's i think that's one way that amd do need to play catch up so i think this is a definitely a step in the right direction but it's not just the gpu of course the cpu as well so even if and it might not sound like a big deal right well, even if it only increases performance 5% on the CPU, it doesn't sell much, does it? I mean, 5%, what's that? If you're getting, let's say, 62 frames a second, what's 5%? Who cares? Even if you've got 10%, it's not that, it doesn't sound that big, right? Well, think of this. Even 5% can be the difference between being there on a chart and being there on a chart. And that, of course, is very critical when gamers look at the best performance for their buck so it can make a massive difference if on let's say five of the eight most played games the ryzen processors are just one percent faster than intel just half a percent faster or just the same speed as intel but cheaper or even a small bit slower than intel but cheaper it can have a massive difference in how the processor is perceived in the minds of a gamer compared to being five or ten percent slower so I do think AMD are on to a winner here. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. Normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe. You'll notice that the set is a little different at the moment because we're actually starting the review process. Windows is gonna be installed right now. Uh, Amy's actually in the other room and she is currently setting up a desktop that we've been sent. So that is having Steam and all of the other bits and pieces downloaded onto it and installed. and you know what the procedure's like when you're getting a new PC. So there's going to be a lot of content coming up over the next week or so. So do stick around for that as well, because I've got a couple of really cool videos that I think you're all going to like. Anyway, normal stuff. Take care of yourselves. I'll see you soon.